And so this morning we come again to Philippians chapter 1. We're looking at a particular paragraph that is here that we drew our sermon from last week, and we will do it again this week. And, And then next week we will finish this paragraph, and I believe that you will have a good understanding of what it means to us, not only what it was for the Philippian church, but also for us. Notice the sermon title from last week. It was, You Are Citizens of Heaven, Honor Christ. Notice there, Colossians, or Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, look at the very top line. It says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And so, whether I come and see you or hear absent from you, that it remain absent, that you are standing firm in one spirit. So, that first line only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, the rest of this paragraph is talking about that. So, you're citizens of heaven, far better than Philippi. You're citizens of heaven, and so you are to act like it. Well, this morning we come and we take another key concept out of this passage that will mean much to us. And the title of the message is, at the top you see there, Stand Firm Together, Know What? No, no long, Lone Ranger Christianity. Now, how many of you remember this show? How many of you remember that? Did you, did you enjoy it? How many of you watched that as a kid growing up? You, you watched that. Now, I'm not talking about the new one with Johnny Depp and some other guy. Um, I, I'm talking about the old one. In fact, I hadn't seen it in many years, and I watched a couple of minutes of one this last week. And boy, the music and all of the stuff that goes on, very dramatic, you know, rather hysterical. Uh, Good storytelling in so many ways. But let me tell you that when people apply the Lone Ranger mentality to their Christianity, they are really going against the true message of Christianity. So this morning, I want this image to get solidly in your mind. This is not the way of Christ, the Lone Ranger out solving the world's problems, the Lone Ranger bringing justice to the world, the Lone Ranger with his sidekick, Tonto, that is not God's plan for us. Let's look and see what God's plan is for us as Christians, not being alone, but being together. First of all, our review shows us that Paul calls the Philippian believers not to compromise their manner of life in Christ. So the way that they live, the manner in which they live, is to not be compromised by the world. In fact, we get that from the word only at the beginning. Do you remember that last week? The word only being placed at the beginning of verse 27 says that this is a very, very important um, prohibition um, or a very, very important emphatic statement only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Don't let it be unworthy. Don't live like the world. You're called to be different. Christ has died and saved you for a purpose. Look at the next part there in the review. Paul calls the Philippian believers to live as citizens of heaven in Philippi. He's calling them to remember that they are gods, that they are part of a new kingdom, They are part of a kingdom that is far greater than the kingdom of the Roman Empire. And so we see this in the language, we see this in the words that he uses there, your manner of life. Um, Last Sunday we had a gentleman in our church um, that was visiting, he's been here before, and he he grew up in Egypt, but he also lives in Athens, uh, Greece. And so he speaks, he actually speaks six languages. And uh, one of those is Greek. And so after the service, he said, you know, Pastor, you were pointing out that the word, the word for manner of life, does anybody remember what was the root word of manner of life? Polis, P-O-L-I-S, it means city, or in, and it's having to do with your conduct as a citizen. So we, we, we see the word polis there, the, the manner of life in which you live, that you're living like a Roman citizen. That was, that was the way in which they would commonly think of it. And Paul is turning that whole view toward heaven. He's saying the people around you are proud of the fact that they're living in a Roman city, but far more than that, you are God's children living as citizens of heaven in Philippi. And so he was, he was saying that. He said that word is also where we get the word policy. 
So the policy, that is the procedure, and that is the conduct, and that is the the standard of which you live. And so he's saying that. You see it, only let your manner of life, only let your policy be that which is worthy of the gospel of Christ. I I just take this opportunity to to let you see that the the language of the Bible is so rich and the, the meaning of it is worth studying. This is why it's good for you to read the Bible. This is why it's good for you to have a Bible dictionary when you're spending time in God's Word. We have Bible dictionaries in the bookstore that are that are very inexpensive but they're very, very helpful. And uh, I think it's good to have the paper and ink copy. It's great to be able to use the electronic things, but one day the lights could go out, and I really mean that. Um, And it it would be good if you have some tools to help you remain true to the Lord in the midst of a difficult time. Um, So a a Bible dictionary is a good thing to have. A, A large exhaustive concordance is a good thing to have. And so when you study the text of the Bible, it can come alive to you. Some of you say, well, each time I read the Bible, I I, I struggle with understanding. That's the reason we study together. And if you will listen and follow along with the way that we study, you will learn how the Bible works. You will learn tools for study. And as you do that, even as the the men's boot camp book that we read, Dig Deeper, um, that's what allows the Word of God to become so alive to us. So um, this is talking about our manner of life worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether he comes and sees them or he remains absent, that he would hear that they are, and this is where we come this morning, specific instructions um, for living a manner worthy of the gospel. And the overarching command that we see in verse 27 is to stand firm, to stand firm. If you have a pen, if you would mark that up there in the box, um, in verse 27 in the box, circle those words, stand firm. Because that is a key thought that the Apostle Paul is hammering for the Philippians. He knows that the Philippians live in a place that is a Roman city filled with Roman ideas, filled with all the ideas of the world, and he's saying, you're citizens of heaven, stand firm. And he uses a term that's a very powerful term. And it's a term that comes from military use. So notice this on your outline. It's a military term used to tell a soldier not to give up ground. You stand your ground. You don't retreat. You don't waver. You hold the place where you are. You hold your position. When the opposition comes, when you're tired, when you're wounded, you still hold the position. And that's the language in which Paul is using for Christians to understand that they are to stand in the Lord, that they are to stand with God. They are to stand as citizens of heaven, not as citizens of the earth who turn and run. So no retreat, no wavering. In fact, this term is used in these various references over and over and over again in the writings of Paul, we see him use the same military term for different people. Now, when the Bible says something once, it's important. But when the Bible says something over and over and over again, you better sit up and listen. That's one of the things we learned in boot camp. Is that right, guys? With the Dig Deep book. The Dig Deep book talks about different tools about how to understand the Bible. And one of those tools is this. When the Bible repeats something over and over again, then you need to see and listen that this is an important command or this is an important point. In fact, the song that we just uh, talked about, Pastor uh, Jason even prayed, and the passage that we read as we began the service is, recognizing that the seraphim angels, seraph means fire, by the way, so the, the glorious, fiery creatures, angelic creatures of fire that hover over the very throne of God at this instant are calling out. They're not saying, holy is God. They are saying, holy, holy, holy. 
is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So the picture is here that the completion of his holiness, he is completely holy. He is perfectly holy. That repetition tells us something. And so here we see the repetition of this term that we are to stand firm should be very instructive to us. You see, the Christian life is no easy thing. The Christian life is no pushover. The Christian life is indeed a life of great struggle and a life of great trouble. We are going to see over and over again as we finish the book of Philippians that the Philippian church is not only in difficulty, but the individuals that are, that are around the Philippian church and even in other cities are struggling to honor God in the midst of a fallen world. The first Timothy cha- or second Timothy chapter three says, "All who are godly in Christ Jesus will suffer hardship." So this is the way of the gospel. The overarching command is a military term saying, "Stand firm." Number one, we are to see how we are to stand firm, and we want to see this also in verse twenty-seven. Look what it says: Christians are to stand firm in unity as. The, as a church body, in unity as a church body, or as unity as the body of Christ. And so this is, this is emphasized three different ways in just a matter of a few words. Look with me in verse 27. In the middle of the verse, it says that I may hear of you that you are, look what it says, standing firm in what? One in one spirit, comma, and then what does it say? with one mind. So you have one spirit, one mind in your attitude and in your thinking. So it's in, it's in, your, in your general overlook, but it's also in the logic of your mind in, in what you're saying and what you're thinking very, very conceptually. And then look what it says, striving what? Some of your Bibles say striving together, which is great. Some of your Bibles say striving, as this says, side by side. So the picture is three different ways that we see it. One spirit, one mind, striving together. Do you think the Apostle Paul is repeating something? Is he using this terminology for a reason? Yes, he's wanting to help us see, just like holy, holy, holy is God, that he is completely holy. He's saying, you have to be unified, one mind, one spirit, striving together. That repetition helps us see something that's very important. Now, there's a lot of different ways that we could, we, could, we could look at the unity of the church, but I want you to see a few things that are here. Number one, um, or, or just notice the next statement here, the Philippian church, as wonderful it was, it had some struggles, and one of the struggles that it had apparently was with unity because we see the first thing out of the box, Paul is saying to them, walk in a manner worthy, and the first thing he brings up is, you be one together. You guys have to stay together. You have to stay together. And we're going to see, and next Sunday even more, we're going to see, because there's opposition. And if you stand alone, you're going to be that lone soldier out on the field. And it's not good to be a lone soldier out on the field when another army is coming. It's good to have a whole army with you. And this is the mindset that Paul is seeking to help us see, help the Philippian church see and help Sheridan Hill see that there is no Lone Ranger Christianity that is going to be very effective in staying faithful to God until you die. This is how we continue in faithfulness is in unity as a body of Christ. So the Philippian church had some trouble. They had some disunity. And just kind of think about that. The opposite of unity is disunity. That means that there's trouble. There's somewhere there. In fact, Philippians is one of those places in the New Testament where names get named. How would you like to be those two women that the Apostle Paul named for 2,000 years of church history to know? So be careful, guys and gals. Somebody may name you, and it may stick around for a while in your disunity. So there was apparently, as we read the book of Philippians, you, you get back there to chapter 4 and verse 2, and we'll study this later, but there were some women that had a hard time getting along, and the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, everybody, encourage these two ladies to get along with each other. 
Um, so for 2,000 years, we know that was a little bit of their struggle, both as a church and as individuals. So notice here that the church is being called to be unified. There's four things to know about the importance of unity. We see the importance of. I've already mentioned one of them um, that's not really on this list, but the idea is that at three times at the beginning of this, it's being brought up. So it's one of the first issues to be brought up in Paul's instructions, but secondly, it's mentioned three different ways in this, and so we're, we're already seeing it's very important. But we just need to recognize as a church, number one, that unity is a very, very big deal to God. Unity is a big deal to God. Letter A, God's own nature and being shows us perfect unity in himself. So when you think about this with me, and I'm going to do this in part for Colvin and everybody else, when we talk about who God is, Father, Son, and Spirit. One God in three persons, three distinct persons. The, the Spirit is not the exact same as the Father, and the Father and the Spirit are not the exact same as the Son. Now, they, they are distinct persons, all existing at the same time, all interacting perfectly in harmony together. They are, they are not like one time God is spirit, another time he's the son, another time he's father. No, we see throughout scripture the presentation that our God is one in three. And it's very clear to make, it's very, very clear to us that he is one. He's not three different gods. He is one God. So listen to this. This is so important. In his nature, in his very being, he is relational. That's an important thing for Christians to understand. The doctrine of the Trinity is very, very important to us. Now, I want to say to you, there is no way for any human being to fully understand the Trinity. And if anybody ever comes to you and says, oh, I got it, I got it, let me explain it to you. You need to run the other direction because he doesn't have it. How God can be one in three in perfect harmony and being yet distinct in each one of those persons is, is not something that we can easily understand. But the Bible makes it clear that that's who he is. And it comes from all the way back in Genesis 1. Let us make man in our image. So the Trinity is showing up in the first chapter of the Bible. This is an important concept. This is who God is. God wants us to know him. And from the very beginning, he's revealing himself to us. You cannot have a relationship with someone you do not know. God, this is the beautiful thing about the Bible. God is revealing to us who he is and what he's like and what he's calling us to be in relationship to him. So our God shows unity in, in just in who he is. So you see that little cloud out there to the side. It's just the concept that our God is one, but he is Father, Son, and Spirit. And listen to this, perfectly united. So underneath that, we see, we say that he is the triune God. Now just look at that word triune. What are the two words that make up triune? Tri means what? Three. Un means what? So he's the three one God. He's the three one God. He's three persons in one. And so he is the triune God, and his nature is three in one. Now, so, so let this be instructed to us that when God talks about relationship and when God talks about unity, he knows all about it because it's who he is. And so, because our God is a God without sin, there is no sin, there is no imperfection in him whatsoever. Listen to this. The Father, Son, and Spirit relate to one another perfectly. There's never an argument. There's never a conflict. There is never anything there. The closest thing that we would ever see to that is when Jesus, the Son, is coming before the Father about to give his life. So this is God laying down his life in the Son for us. 
This is the great, so if anything is gonna cause this, is that climactic moment in human history when God is laying down his life for the Son. And the Bible tells us that this perfect God in the Son, it says that he who knew no sin, he who was never sinful, had no impact of sin. Listen to this. He who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus takes our sin to the cross and he takes it to the grave and then he overcomes it with his powerful resurrection. He is saying, I have paid for your sin and I have victory over your sin. This is why I can save you. And so if you'll simply come to me and trust in me, the savior of your sin, the savior of who you are, the payment for your sin, I can give you eternal life. Sin brings death, I bring life. Now this is the glorious nature of a triune God who gives himself for us and he is one in three. The second way that we see that the idea of unity is so big to God. It's not only because he is, un he is one, but look at letter B, and I've just mentioned it. God sacrificed himself for our unity with him. And so how important is unity to God concerning us? He would lay down his own life. He would send, for us to understand the kind of impact of this, that he would send his own son. He would send part of himself to come and become what he is not, to become sin for us. And so he takes our sin on himself, he forgives it through his death and resurrection and our faith that he gives to us, and then we are made one with him. We are unified, we are reunited with him. So letter B is God sacrificed himself for our unity with him. Letter C. We also see it's a big deal to God when we see that Jesus' command and great prayer was for our unity with each other. So in John chapter 3, or excuse me, John chapter 13, it says, you are to be one. He says, a commandment I give to you. You are to be one as I and the Father are one. And then a few, a few chapters later in John 17, and this is, you know, there's a limit to how much I can put on the outline. I really wish I could have put this text on the outline because I want you to take it home and look it up and read it and study it. So you're just gonna have to do that on your own a little bit. But look at John 17, 20 through 23 and circle that on your outline. This is what you're about to see on the screen. This is a key passage for us when it comes to understanding unity, when it comes to understanding the unity in the church and the unity of us with God. Look at John, Jesus' prayer, and that's what you can put out there to the side. This is called his high priestly prayer. This is when Jesus is praying before his crucifixion for us. And we want to see his high priestly prayer for us. Look at John chapter 17 and verse 20. In verse 20, he says, and he's speaking to the Father, and he says, I do not ask for these only, that's the disciples, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word. Okay, so who's the second group? You see, the, the first group is I do not ask only for these that are in front of me, Jesus is about to pray for them, for these only, but I pray for who will believe in them according or by their word. Who is that? Somebody said it, yeah, us. That's us. Why have we believed? We believe because the disciples spoke the word. The disciples told what Jesus had done. So you can put in verse 20, that's me. That's you if you're a believer in Christ that you heard the word of the gospel. How did the word of the gospel come to you? It came through the disciples after Jesus ascended to the Father, and it came through the church. It came through the word of God. They wrote down God's great works upon the earth. They bring it together for us. Preachers have preached the gospel. Moms and dads have taught the gospel to their children. Women have discipled women through the last 2,000 years so that the gospel continues with us. So it's not only he's asking for these that are right in front of him, but but he's asking for 2,000 years up to this point of those who are going to believe upon their, upon their word. And look what he says in verse 21. That they may all be what? Keywords. 
that they may all be one just as, here it is again, here's the Father and the Son, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also, that they also may be in us so that the world might believe that you have sent me. Look at verse 22. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one, so that the world may know that you sent me, and I in the, sorry, excuse me, in verse 23, he says, and I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. So three times he's saying that. Again, repetition. Three times he's saying that you are one in me, I am one in them, they are to be one together. And then again we see, I am one, you are one, perfectly one. Look at verse 23. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even, even as you have loved me. This is an extremely profound picture of the whole reason Jesus came. It is the whole picture that the Father and the Son are uniting the world to themselves, to God. And it's all through the glory of the risen Christ. And so this is the picture that, look at letter C on your outline there. Jesus' commanding great prayer for, was for our unity with each other. Um, this, is, this is a very, very important thing to God. So, number two, another thing that we need to understand as a church about unity is that unity is the godly design of every relationship. When it comes to beings that can relate to one another, this is God's original design, that they would be unified, that they would be together. You see, God loves it, God loves unity, and Satan hates unity, Satan is warring against the image of God and the glory of God at every chance he can. He wants to bring shame. He wants to curse God. That's what he does, and that's what he'll do in your life, is seek to tear out every image of God within you. As time goes on, we see this becoming more and more and more um, apparent, uh, we see this in the whole question over gender issues. I don't, I don't preach about that every single Sunday, but I do. I do occasionally mention to you because it's so powerful in our culture right now. Listen to this. Genesis 1 and 2 makes very, very clear that male and female were made in the image of God as relational beings for the glory of God and for his purposes on the earth. And when we start to confuse all of that, when we start to blur all the lines, when we start to come and to, see, to change all of this mentality and the, the whole picture and understanding of gender and the glory of God in gender, all of this is an attack on the image of God. And so we as Christians need to see that immediately as, wow, Satan is really pulling out all the big guns at this point. Satan is getting us to even question and doubt things that haven't even been considered for thousands of years on a societal level. And so we, we, we just need to recognize that this is all part of God's design, that unity and his design is very good, and that relationships are to be healthy and unified. Look at number three. Unity is peaceful, joyful, and productive. Unity is a good thing. Think about it. When people are together, there's peace. I mean, when they're together in mind and heart, sometimes you say, well, you don't understand my people. When they're together, there's no peace. Well, that's not unity. I'm talking about when people are together and they're on the same page. They're on the same page about what we're doing, what, what is important. Maybe in a family or maybe in a, in a business or maybe in a church. When there's unity, maybe in a nation, when there's unity, there's a mind for it. And notice this, it's peaceful. And it's joyful. I mean, how beautiful. Psalm 133 says, how good it is when brothers dwell together in harmony. This is a good thing. So it's joyful and it's productive. It's really productive when, you know, you can do a lot together that you can't do on your own. 
So look at all the beauty and the benefits and all the joy of unity. But look at disunity. Think about it with me. Disunity is stressful. It's not peaceful. It's stressful. And disunity is not joyful. It's frustrating. And it can even bring great sadness. So the opposite of joyful. And disunity is not productive. Disunity is destructive. If the level of destruction of disunity um, continues, it will destroy whatever portions and whatever, whatever are the elements of people that are together. Whether it's a nation, it can destroy a nation. There can be civil war. And then civil war open up very often through history when one country has a civil war within itself, another country comes and capitalizes on that and destroys and takes over. Civil war often leads to vulnerability to other things. So there, there's, there's, whether it's at a societal level or whether it's at a family level or the level of a friendship, there are, there's a great difference between the unity and disunity. Number five, we need to recognize that our unity with each other is our greatest witness to the world. This is our greatest witness to the world. It's not having a great evangelist that flies around the world preaching the gospel. It is not, you know, one or two people in the life of the church that really know how to share the faith. Um, but notice this passage. Don't turn your sheet over. Look at John chapter 13 and verse 35 at the bottom. In fact, I'd like to all of us to read John 13 and verse 35 at the, at the end here of the page. This is Jesus talking, and look what he says. Let's read it. Verse 35 says, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So you want to know, Jesus is saying, everybody's going to know that you're mine if you love one another. This is the beautiful picture that I am with you, the God of unity the God of relationship, if you love one another. So there's, you know, there's a lot of different things that I could make as subtitles here for the sermon. The one I chose was Stand Firm Together, No Lane, Lone Ranger Christianity, because listen to this, in American society, one of the great struggles for the church is the individualistic mindset of Christians in America. People come to America from other countries, maybe maybe your generation, maybe you came from another country. Um, so, you know, you're coming to a new place. You're having to start over. You're having to make it. Uh, or maybe it was your parents, or maybe it was your grandparents, or in my case, maybe it's your great, 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 great grandparents that came over on a boat somewhere along the way. And as they come in, they have this pioneering mindset. We have to work hard. We have to make it. We don't have the house that my father owned. We don't have the resources of the rest of my family. I have to find a way to make it. That's been the American spirit. That's been, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. That is wonderful. That is a wonderful aspect of our country. When I work with people from other countries, Marcy and I lived overseas for a long time, and I would talk to my British friends or talk to my French friends or talk to North African friends, and I would say, what are your impressions of Americans? And they would say, very often they would all say the same thing. They, they would say, very hardworking and very, very independent, ready to go for it. And that is seen as a a great trait that much of the world looks up to us as Americans. Maybe you came from Cuba. Maybe you came from Haiti. Maybe you came from Norway, wherever you come from, that we often have that. But that is very, very destructive to the Christian mindset. You see, our independence and our go-it-alone mentality can be very harmful to the body of Christ. Because we can, we can be predisposed not to let people endorse it. We can predispose not to let people help us or not to help others. We can say, well, I got to do my thing. I got to go for it. And we can start to live isolated lives. Whereas, now just switch gears from America 
to maybe countries in Africa or countries in Central Asia, in India, communities in India that they don't have the wealth that we have. That we have. They don't have all of the resources that, that we have. And so they're forced to work together. They're forced to let people in. And, and people in small villages, I mean, when the storm comes and the mudslides hit, hit man, they're, they're reaching out to one another. They're forced to include one another in their lives. And so there's much of the world that when hunger comes and enemies come or cataclysmic things come, they are forced to be together. Many, many of us would say that, well, you know, before Hurricane Irma or before Hurricane Wilma or before Hurricane whatever hit, I didn't know my neighbors. But after that, I got to know my neighbors. There's a small example of it, that trouble comes along. I mean, when you think about New York City, how did New York City change Lamadas after 9-11. I mean, there was, there was a massive change in the mentality of the city. People, instead of you say, where, where is this? They go, I don't know, and keep going. They would, I've had business people walking down the street busy with their colleagues, and I say, excuse me, I'm trying to find this. And they go, I'll take you. Let me take you. And I couldn't believe it. I thought I was in Georgia. I mean, I was like, wow. Um, things changed. And so, we need to understand that one of the greatest ways that the world sees God in us is that when we love one another and that we forgive one another and we help one another and we work with one another, depend upon one another. Um, Americans have a hard time with that. Let's look at this a little bit more. Romans chapter 12, flip the sheet and see Romans chapter 12. We see this important aspect of unity. And there's many, many passages that we could go to, but I want you to see just one in Romans 12, 4 and 5, and then skip down to verse 16. Look what it says there in verse 4. For as in one body we have many members, now that's not names on a list, but that's arms and legs and hands and ankles and all of that. This is talking about anatomy. This is talking about the body of Christ, the picture that the Scripture often gives us. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. I mean, does my ankle have the same function as my ear? No, they have radically different functions. But so in that, that's the way it is in the church. Look in verse 5. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, individually members one of another. Can you underline that? Individually members one of another. You see, your life will change if you, I'd like everybody right now to just look around at the people sitting next to you. Would you look, take a good look at them. I know it's awkward. Just turn, turn around and look at the people behind you. Can you see the people behind you? Look at the people in front of you. Just look at them. Yeah, that's good. Shake their hand. Look around. I'm, some of y'all are looking at me. Look around. You're like, you, you look at the guy next to you and you, you to turn away, you know. Don't be weird. Look around. You see, we need to start to see this verse in us that when we come together as a church that we recognize, wow, th these people are part of me. Amen. And we're part of something bigger. We're connected. We're all connected in Christ. And, you know, we don't need to get into an argument about whether you're a, you know, an ankle or an ear or a butt cheek or whatever. I mean, that, that's not... You know, we don't, it's not, the, the picture is that we're one body functioning together. And, and, and all important. I mean, try going through life without a butt cheek. It's, you know, that's not, <laughs> mess up your back. I'm going to get in trouble for that, sorry. Okay. <laughs> but look at verse 16. Look at verse 16. Live in harmony with one another. Oh. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. You see, the Apostle Paul, over and over and again, through letter after letter after letter, he is helping us see, and the Holy Spirit is the one who's inspiring the Apostle Paul. The Holy Spirit is saying to us, that we are in Christ, so we are to be unified in Him. Look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27 and 28. 
We see this. This is so beautiful to me. Look at verse 27. For as many, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. He's saying anyone who has come to Christ has been immersed in Christ. Talking about physical baptism possibly, but also the whole picture that your whole life is now found in Christ. Your salvation. So for as many of you, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That means you've taken on his life. Look at verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. Now, these are huge words in their society. I mean, the Jews stood apart from the Greeks, and the Greeks stood apart from the Jews, the Gentiles. And the picture is that they, man, they just didn't associate. They just weren't together. You just don't mix those two groups. And here he's saying, oh, yeah, you do. And you do because of Christ. And look at the next group, slave versus free. I mean, you talk about two massive distinctions. And see, this is part of the beauty of slavery and freedom in the church of the first century. It got to proclaim Christ. So when people on the outside would look to the inside and they would say, who is this group of people that you associate with? And they finally see you, they see you down by the river, they see you in a meeting, they see you coming out, and they see free men and slaves living and loving and and caring for one another. In their society, that would never happen, but they see it and they say, why do you do this? And they say, that's my brother in Christ. The master says, this is my brother in Christ. The slave says, this is my brother in Christ. And so that, that stark difference and part of that in us just cries out with all the injustice. And God is saying, all the opportunity to show you what love looks like. And so the picture is this, is that there's neither slave nor free. There's no no male or female, for you are all one in Christ. Now, let's quickly answer this. Does this mean, well, once you become a Christian, there are no Jews and there are no Greeks? No, you're still Jew. Your ethnicity doesn't change. And for many, perhaps your status did not slave, either free or slaves. You're You're still a slave or you're still free, and male and female, your gender doesn't suddenly go non-gender. That, that, that's not what this is about. The point is, all those things are, real, are still there, but they're saying the identity of your worth in who you are is the same because it's in Christ. It doesn't matter that you are one of these over the other. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 29. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So the promise that God would give to Abraham that there's going to be many that are in his family and that those people are the family of God in this beautiful picture is that the coming of our salvation and all that is there. This is a glorious statement. So what we start to see is, is that the unity that the church is to have supersedes all other identities. In the life of this church, we need to see one another as a brother or a sister in Christ, not some other subculture, not some other aspect of rich or poor or certain ethnicity or anything along those lines. That is not the spirit of Christ. The spirit of Christ is, there is another sinner just like me, saved by the glorious grace of God. Oh, the picture that is so different from the way our world thinks. You see, number two is this. Christians are to stand firm, working hard together. I love the language that is here, striving side by side or striving together. This is a single word athletic term. This is, this is an athletic term. And notice the first part of is sine or the, is with, sin. And then the next part is from atheo, athleo. And what are you hearing that? Athletic, right? So it's sine athleo. And the idea is is that you compete with someone, that you're competing alongside someone. Here's the picture. It's not um, an individual sport. It's a team sport. This is the picture. Christianity is a team sport, not an individual sport. So it's not the runner that runs the race by himself. This is the relay. 
That's the picture. This is the relay. This is the team sport that has to do with two people working together, competing together against other opponents. And so even in the language of this, the word striving side by side is one word that means um, this picture. So this is where we get the idea of no Lone Ranger Christianity, no American individualism. That is not the spirit in the true church of Christ. We are a team with many different gifts and roles that work together to win the prize. So we're not in competition with one another. We are linking arms with one another, opposing the world. Now, there are many churches that would be changed if they would look at this word, this simple Greek word, and start to live it out in their lives. You see, there's some churches that are in the I'm holier than you competition, that they come to church and they want to see who knows best, most theology, who um, gives the most, who looks the best, who sings the best, who serves the most, you know, it's all of these things. It's a, it's a bit of a competition of holiness. That has no place in the life of the church. We're all called to follow the life of Christ and be holy and give him what we've got, give him all that we've got. And so the the picture is, is that we are unified together, realizing that one man's strengths and another man's weaknesses, or one gal's abilities and another gal's inabilities, all link together to form a team that is truly, truly strong. This is the idea of working hard together side by side. Um, So look up there in verse 27. Let's see it again. He says that I may hear of you that you're standing firm in one spirit, striving, here's what we've just looked at, striving side by side, that's the athletic term, and for what? For the faith of the gospel. That's in the end of verse 27, for the faith of the gospel. So Christians are not only to stand firm working hard together, but Christians, number three, Christians are to stand firm for the faith of the gospel. Now, here again, we reiterate this. We are to stand firm for the faith of the gospel, not for ourselves. This isn't a competition with somebody else. Not for our kingdom. You see, many people are busy building their own kingdom, whether it's in their business or in their family or whether it's even in their church, that they're building their own little kingdom of notoriety and own little kingdom of pleasure and own little kingdom of, of perhaps wealth. The picture is we're, we're not to be driven by that. We're to build not our kingdom, but his kingdom. It's not for our subcultures. Um, several years ago, I heard Hillary Clinton mention a book called The Big Sort And something just, I I think it was the Lord just kind of said, you need to get that book. And she just mentioned it in an interview, and this was 10 years ago. And I read the book, The Big Sort. And the idea of The Big Sort is is that America continues to go into each subculture. And and the idea is, she didn't write the book, she she was just referencing it, that someone had just said, man, the more we sort, the more disunified we we become. And if you sort enough, it can lead to civil war. That's often what happens in societies around the world, that when people go live in different places, operate their world within their subculture, and only begin to think within their subculture, they grow in intolerance towards others. And that's a dangerous thing. Now, the book, as I read it, I realized, okay, this is written from a pretty liberal perspective, some things I agreed with, some things I probably didn't agree with very much. But it was very helpful that someone was showing that this is, this is all about disunity. This isn't about finding common ground and sticking together for a purpose. And so the gospel assaults that mentality in us. It says, the, way, the reason that you stand firm is not for yourselves. The reason that you stand firm, that the church's reason to stand firm is for the faith of the gospel. This is God's work on the earth for his glory. And so look at this with me, fill it in. We stand firm for the glorious Christ-centered gospel of God's salvation. That's what we stand for. Not the man-centered 
version of God's salvation, which is, oh, you can do it. If you just keep trying hard enough and you look shiny enough and everything else, you're going you're gonna to make it yourself. Or we're building the church for ourselves. You know, th- this is all about, you know, I go to that church. And th- this is, you know, the, the, the ultimate self-centered um, gospel. Not at all. The gospel that the gospel, excuse me, the gospel that Paul is talking about is talking about the true gospel that is centered all around what Jesus did for us. It's not about what we do, it's about what he did. And every song that we sing and every, de- every question that we have that we're dealing with the difficulties of life, every issue that we experience, that we are interpreting it through the love and sacrifice of Christ saving us from ourselves. You see, our purpose is his. Let's read these out loud together. I've left them filled in for you. Let's read them out loud together. What is the first one there? Our purpose is his purpose. That was very weak. Let's do that one again. Our purpose is his purpose. Our goal is his goal. Our message is his message. We don't need to tinker with it. We don't need to mess with it. We don't need to change the message. We don't need to worry that it's too offensive. No, people are sinners in need of a Savior. If you're here today and you don't like that, you don't have a problem with me. You have a problem with God. The issue is, is that we are telling his story, that we are living for his purpose. We are his servants, and he is the master. Notice here with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. This is so important for us to see. Paul writing to the Corinth church, it says, verse 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Who is the God of this age? Satan. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Look at verse 5. For we do not proclaim ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. You see, they're, they're working, striving for God's glory and for the good of their brothers and sisters in Christ. Look at verse 6. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the big problem mentioned in verse 4, that the blinded eyes from Satan is only overcome through the big salvation in verse 6, that God who said, let there be light, can say, let there be light in this blinded unbeliever's heart. See, salvation is from God. The faith of the gospel that we proclaim comes through God saving us and doing a work in us. It is so beautiful. Look what it says there at the end of verse 6. He made his light to shine in our hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, friends, this is the gospel we proclaim. This is what we stand on. This is the difference between heaven and hell for people around us. We must not be silent about this. We must not shrink back from the faith of the gospel. We do not let the world intimidate us and shut us up, saying that, oh, that's offensive. People don't want to hear that they're sinners. They don't want to hear that Jesus is the only way. Friends, we didn't make that up. That's what God said. And so when we proclaim the gospel, the gospel is shed light in people's hearts. God uses that and saves people by his power and not our own. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4. A great warning to the church about leaving the gospel. A great warning to Sheridan Hills that there are many who will leave the faith of the gospel. They will not stand firm in the faith of the gospel as time draws near. Look what it says in verse 1. Paul is writing to Timothy, a young preacher, and he says to him, I charge you in the presence of God in Christ and of Christ Jesus. Now, that's a huge statement. He's saying, Timothy, listen to what I'm about to say. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and in his his kingdom. Verse 2, what does it say? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with great patience. And look what it says and teaching 
Do you see, we, we preach the word as we teach it. We teach that. We want to do that patiently. We're trying to bring as many of you along to understand the true gospel, that it's not about you, it's all about him. We're trying to patiently, painstakingly teach the gospel, even when it's not popular, to rebuke, to exhort, to bring with patience and teaching. Look at verse 3. For the time is coming... When people will not endure sound doctrine or sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. Verse 4, look what it says. And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Friends, that has been going on for 2,000 years. For 2,000 years, there's people that go and they find a preacher that will tell them what they want to hear. And we see that powerful in this world today. We see that powerful in Africa. We see that happening in Europe. And unfortunately, a lot of what is being preached today in other places is coming out of America. Much of the gospel voices in America Um, that are so powerful through media and other things that are not on par with what the Scripture says, much of that is infecting the world in other places. I have told you story after story of being in Africa and having men come to me, women come to me and saying, hey, pastor, people don't all fall down when we proclaim the Word of God here. Why, why, why don't we see it like in Florida, on, in Orlando, from the guys that are on TV? And we're like, brother, you have the Word of God. People are coming to faith in Jesus. You're discipling people. Stay with that. You're not looking for some sensational experience that is here today and gone tomorrow, that we don't really know sometimes the origin of it. Is it a hypnotist? Is it the powerful personality of an individual? Is it the hype that is around it in in, in even sensuality? Or is it the true gospel of God? And so I want to say to you that there are all kinds of teachers that are rising up in our world today, seeking, becoming popular because they are that they are preaching to itching ears that simply want a certain gospel that and is in accordance with their own desires. No, Christians are to stand firm in the faith of the gospel, in the faith of the true gospel of Jesus Christ, preaching the word, not altering it. Okay, look at these two things. Go back to the front front page. Look at the front page a little bit. What have we said? Christians are to stand firm in unity as a church body. There is not to be room for individualism that says, I'm happy to come and sit on Sunday morning and then get in my car and leave. I come, I like the music, I like the preaching, people seem to be nice, the temperature is pretty good. You don't give, you don't want to know anybody, you don't want to relate to anyone. You don't want to sacrifice. You don't want to serve. You don't want to interrupt your schedule. Friends, that is not Christianity. That is religion. And religion will take you merrily to hell. Let this be a warning to you that the true body of Christ is connected and desires one another and prays for one another and loves one another, goes through the good times and goes through the bad times, and does not attack one another. Haven't even talked about that as part of the unity issue here. It's more about overcoming our individualism, that we are striving together for the sake of the gospel. So my question to you is this. Where are you standing? Are you standing in unbelief of Christ? I mean, have you, do you have the great common denominator of salvation in Christ? Maybe you're not connected to the church because you have not come to faith in Jesus. Or are you standing in faith? The opposite of that. Are you standing in faith in Christ? 
And I would say to you, praise God if you have come to trusting in Christ as your only hope. But then I ask you, are you standing alone? Are you standing alone in your faith? Or are you standing with the body of Christ? Our church is shooting for the goal of us standing together in the body of Christ. I call you to stand firm together in Christ. That means become a member of a body of Christ. If not this church, a Bible teaching church. That means submit yourself to the body of Christ. I'm a member of this church. I submit to you as my church family. I call you to do the same. That means coming and giving your life for the sake of the gospel together. That means entering in, being the arm, being the leg, being the whatever, connected in the body of Christ so that Christ may be glorified. And listen to this, so the world may see us. And when they see us, they see the Father. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together.